Buonasera, grazie a tutti voi che ci seguite dopo anche molti eventi durante la giornata in questo evento serale del Festival dell'Economia edizione 2020. Eh, ci sono poche persone, eh, anzi pochissime persone, eh, che sono in grado di offrirci una visione globale di quello che sta accadendo. Spesso prevale una visione particolare all'interno dei singoli paesi. Eh, tra queste pochissime persone eh, c'è Michael Spence. Eh, Michael Spence è già stato a diverse edizioni del nostro festival dell'economia, quindi eh, non c'è bisogno eh, di eh, eh, parole per eh, introdurlo alla vostra attenzione. Eh, ha vinto il premio Nobel per l'economia nel 2021 eh, per le sue teorie in, di informazione imperfetta, in particolare con i suoi modelli di signaling assieme a George Akerlof e poi ha sempre avuto un ruolo molto importante come eh, proprio formatore di opinione e come eh, analista di quello che avveniva su scala globale. Analista di quello che stava avvenendo su scala globale. Era il presidente della Commissione Europea Globale per il Sviluppo e la Crescita. E è ancora molto attivo in guidare le visioni which are being formed on the global consequences of the uh, pandemic. His recent intervention in uh, Rogers Syndicate, uh, checking and trying to understand who are the winners and the losers of the global pandemic, trying to follow the evolution, um, noting that inequalities have increased, and trying to understand what uh, are the structural changes and acting on uh, financial markets. Uh, uh, Rob Johnson is the sparring partner tonight, and uh, uh, those who follow the festival uh, know him very well. He is the president of INET, uh, the Institute for New Economic Thinking, uh, a think tank uh, who, uh, which has uh, given very important uh, works, one which uh, contributed to support uh, uncharted uh, and study uncharted waters going against uh, uh, the dominant thinking. He plays a, a major role in the world. He's a member of expert committee of the United Nations on the reform of the international monetary system. Rob Johnson and Mike Spence are with us, and they will uh, uh, have a dialogue on a number of issues. They will start from the uh, consequences of the pandemic globally, the new uh, inequalities which have added up to old inequalities, what's going on uh, in the field of deglobalization, a term which was used also in previous editions of the festival. What can we expect from technology change? We spoke of that yesterday with Esther Duflo. And uh, another key uh, issue connected with uh, this year uh, festival, what's going on uh, in terms of uh, climate, and the uh, uh, new uh, balances which are being created internationally, in particular considering uh, southern hemisphere countries. So uh, I will be uh, simply uh, collecting the suggestions or the questions uh, from the audience for our two distinguished speakers. There's, we'll speak about for 30, 35 minutes and they are indeed uh, available to uh, uh, take your questions, if any. So please send your questions. We uh, will collect them, and uh, we will propose some of these questions to our distinguished speakers. So that's it. I would like uh, to uh, give the floor to Rob Johnson to start this very interesting discussion. You have the floor. Well, thank you, Tito. As I was watching the introductory video and seeing the Opera House and thinking of years past, 
where people like Mike Spence and yourself were on stage. I, I'm just always thrilled to be a part of the Trento Economic Festival. But I must underscore how unusual it is and how much I miss being there by quoting my colleague at INET and former chairman of the board, Adair Turner, who said, never in his life had he seen the words economics and festival tied together that made any sense <laughs> until he came to Trento. <laughs> So Great. this is a beautiful experience. I look forward to, in the future, rejoining you in that opera house, along with Mike and others. And, but today, we're, how do you say, coping with the world that we have. And uh, it's very, how do you say, we'll do our best. But thank you, Tito, for creating this forum and for shepherding it for all these years, including this day here today. What I'd like to focus on is INET has a commission. It's called the Commission on Global Economic Transformation. It's been at work for about three and a half years. And how the disruption and transformation is taking place and how society is addressing it becomes even more urgent to comprehend and address in light of the pandemic. And as Mike and I prepared for this, we talked about some pathways that we were already on, particularly related to technical change, may now accelerate. But there are new challenges, things that have been unmasked by COVID-19 and about the nature and the resilience of our global system. And so we will both explore the accelerations that can do us help can be helpful even if daunting at times and some of the changes in course that are called for. Mike, you've worked very closely with an uh, ally of INET that you helped us connect to the Luhan Academy and you have developed with them and, and I've seen you present on the question of pandemic tracking and how this measuring and observing technology is showing us things that in a previous age we wouldn't have been able to understand or comprehend. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what you've learned using those tools and what, what do you see happening as a result of the pandemic? Hey, thanks, Rob and Tito. It's great to be with you. And I wish I, I like Rob, I, I treasure the time at, um, at the festival, and uh, and uh, and and I hope to be back with you in person and just as soon as possible. Um, so the this academy, which has uh, was this kind of spin out of Alibaba and Ant Financial, set themselves the task of trying to track simultaneously in real time across the entire global economy the coevolution of the virus and the pandemic. So we got tons of data and writing on the pandemic and we've got at least you know a growing body of stuff on the uh on the the economy but you know the policy makers who are the people who are entrusted to make these very tough choices for us have to sort of do this trade-off in real time and they need to know where they are so when they develop pandemic tracking graphs i'm not going to go into the details but basically what you see on these graphs is that in in real time almost daily the magnitude of the contraction and the state of um, the speed of spreading of the virus. They do that by measuring how fast the, the confirmed cases are doubling. And so what you see um, is a number of things, and I'll just tick them off because we don't have a mountain of time tonight. One, the Asian economies have by and large done better in controlling the virus and engineering relatively rapid recoveries. And the, the, there are a number of reasons for that. They, they had more practice. They were better prepared. Um, second, they were more aggressive. And then third, probably because of this past experience, you know, the compliance with um, countermeasures like social distancing and so on, even when they weren't mandated, uh, were, were pretty good. Most of the Western world, the developed countries, 
you know, got started at this late. So we had pretty big outbreaks um, and we had to sort of, you know, engineer relatively large contractions. We're now in the in the phase of, you know, a stuttering recovery. I think the, the recovery patterns are probably going to look like, um, you know, what the French call the wing of a bird or somebody, some people call, you know, the square root side. Basically, you're going to get some things recovering fairly quickly in a number of sectors that are really struggling, like international air travel, hospitality, things that involve large groups of people or semi-large groups of people getting together. If you if you just shift gears a little bit and say, well, what about you know the sort of uh, 60, 70, or 80 percent of the world's population that lives in developing countries, then you then you see really quite a diverse um, set of patterns. So China is probably for of the major big economies in the world is probably the furthest along in terms of recovery, but every country is going to face headwinds because they all trade with each other. And, you know, and so you can't recover completely <laughs> until everybody's recovered. Right. Um, but the, I would say just, you know, because we don't have time to kind of review it all. I mean, the one that's really worrying is India. So India is recovering economically, but the virus is still relatively out of control. People, you know, get confused because the numbers are so large because it's a huge country in terms of population. But the virus is, is still doubling at, at, at a rate that's not a huge amount over 20 days. And that's, that's you know, the danger zone. Um, just a couple of other ob observations. What we, we, but using slightly different data sets, we know that this virus has been a huge negative shock, not only economically broadly defined, but it's been a huge negative shock for, in terms of distribution, right? So. Within, both within countries and internationally. Within countries, the hardest hit people, the ones who've either lost their jobs or are working in various dangerous conditions because they're in essential works, are not entirely, but you know, skewed toward the lower half of the income and wealth distribution. And that's just the way it is. I mean, I guess the simplest example is if you look at the hospitality sector in the United States, 4% of those jobs can be done from home. The sector had to be largely shut down. That's 16 or 17 million jobs. Those people are furloughed or out of work, and they don't know when they're going to going to make it back. Um, and that story gets repeated over and over again. Um, and internationally, the most vulnerable countries are the ones that have limited fiscal resources uh, and limited medical capacity to handle these surges that come when the panic when the pandemic gets out of control. And that, broadly speaking, is a fairly substantial subset of the developing countries. So, so Rob, my, my, Rob's view and mine, I think, and I don't mean to speak for Rob, is that we, we have some very important long-term challenges to deal with, um, but we have to start from where we are. And, and, the, and at least in some dimensions, um, the, the pandemic economy has, has um, knocked us back um, several steps. I'd also emphasize, Mike, that we uh, are seeing a very interesting race or tension related to the formation of a vaccine. And the whole question of the value of patents and intellectual property protection is brought into very stark relief by this challenge because it doesn't really matter for planet Earth, which country is the winner? It doesn't really even feel good to worry about protecting property rights for anyone which might slow down the introduction and dissemination of a vaccine, which will, in, among other things, save a lot of lives and bring the economy back sooner. So there's a great deal of uh, pressure and tension, and I see, particularly in the U.S.-China relationship, uh, which you might call um, falling back to the impulses that don't have much to do with the public good. Yeah. No, this is right. I mean, I call this at the risk of being excessively 
outspoken on a you know irresponsible non non cooperative behavior at at the level of governments uh, and the United States you know I think is front and center in in that dimension. Having said that, Rob, I do think that the biomedical you know community globally has done. A, a pretty good job of trying to sidestep these tensions and cooperate with yeah. each other, um, and uh, and so I, I think there's some hope that you know this this layer below the kind of you know kind of national decision making level will will prevail to some extent, and then once we have therapeutics and viruses, we'll we'll come together somehow and. Uh, and try to just you know make this produce mass produce it and make it available as fast as possible globally. Well, Mike, uh, it's interesting that you say that, and, and that these potentially the scientists and the medical professionals rising above. But we are seeing what you and I have discussed as a kind of deglobalization. People hunkering down. And, and in some ways, it was in process before the arrival of the pandemic, okay. the nationalism okay. and so forth that we've seen. But I, but I also see it, how we say, beyond the pandemic, where this tension between cybersecurity and e-commerce platforms and how you have a multilateral commercial system, but how we say, protect data within each country that emanates from these platforms. I think this is a tension that uh, I'm not sure that the pandemic accelerates, but the role of the pandemic in deglobalization perhaps fosters balkanization and parallel systems rather than an integrated system as the ultimate goal. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, it, it certainly didn't help. Uh, and we were we were struggling with very complex issues having to do with digital technology. So we are seeing fragmentation in a number of sectors, especially those that you know have big digital components. Some of it's around data, and I think you know probably there are pathways forward that we can we can you know that aren't costless but are not so costly as to as to be kind of fatal. Um, for dealing with data questions, but but it goes well beyond that. You know that the digital. <laughs> one of the things that's kind of new is we've always had dual use technologies, and you and I have talked about this before. But they usually came from space or national security or the military or something, and then spilled over into the commercial sector. You know this these technologies are by and large coming from the commercial sector, and then it turns out they have national security implications. Right and the core centers of innovation in, you know, in critical areas like artificial intelligence are still, you know, around the platforms in academia and and in the in the so-called private sector. So, uh, you know, this is kind of a new game that we don't know how to play. And but we're seeing it played out in real time. I mean, I, uh, you know, I'm fascinated by the chaos surrounding TikTok uh, right now. I mean. <laughs> And this is an app for teenagers, you know, but but it's a big app, you know, 100 million users in the United States. India's banned it. The Chinese aren't, you know, view the algorithms as intellectual property. I mean, who knows how this is going to come out? Um, but I but I think, you know, none of us has a kind of picture of, you know, how to get down the path and, and know where we're going. But but there are, you know, tensions of the type that you mentioned that are that threaten international uh, cooperation where there are really big benefits. And we just hope they don't get out of hand. You know, they, we hope they don't adversely affect our attempt to deal with the monumental challenge of climate change, for example. Um, but, but we can't say we've won that battle yet. Yeah. Well, beyond though technology played a role in their formation, uh, it's not Strictly, strictly a technical problem to see the unraveling of many global supply chains and the notion right. of resilience and the notion of health standards or production standards related to the manufacturing of toys and for children and, and what have you. I think these, these tensions or these anxieties may change the nature of the structure of our global economies rather profoundly. 
Yeah, some of it will be destructive, and some of it's just natural, Rob. You know, so, I mean, we, we, you know, just to take a kind of slight aside, one of the reasons we saw deglobalization in the form of declining trade as a fraction of GDP was just simply a statistical phenomenon. You know, big countries got rich, like China. And, you know, so China produced a ton of stuff 25 years ago and sold most of it to us because they weren't buying it domestically. Now they, they produce a ton of stuff and sell a whole lot of it to themselves, meaning their own consumers. And so when you take, you know, ratios, you, you know, you get uh, kind of, uh, and, the, and this has been documented statistically. I mean, second, um, digital technology is in certain areas, automation, um, dismantling the sort of labor arbitrage version mm -hmm. of uh, globalization that we got so used to. And then when you pile on top the tensions that, uh, that are developing between, it isn't just the United States and China. I mean, it's, you know, Europe has its problems. Um, we have problems with China. And so we, we, we're kind of in a new world in that dimension. We, we don't, I, I think, we haven't figured out which game we're going to play um, is, one, is one way to describe it. Well, Mike, our, our recent history with automation replacing jobs and seemingly many of the new jobs have we might call lower wage or lower uh, value added. Uh, so that, as Peter Temin wrote in his INET sponsored book, the vanishing middle class was the punchline of the story. But I, I look now and I, I see a lot of us at home working with these tools. And this is an acceleration of which mm -hmm. might call the nature of work, the mode of work, different types of training. There, there can be frightening and daunting aspects of technology, but there are also some problems to solve that couldn't be solved without technology. Things like integration of markets in developing countries to bring them on stream. Yep. Br a broadening of education, particularly to the underserved regions of the world. They, what, how do you see the role of information gaps and data and uh, all of the po the possibilities that are positive in light of all of the fears that have surrounded us in recent years and the anxiety about the future of work. Well, the f I think the future of work and that transition is a kind of serious issue, but it's kind of dominated the discussion, right? And so uh, the flip side of that is I think there's a kind of uh, a revolution underway. If I'm risk exaggerating a little bit you know way back when george and joe and i were thinking about and trying to understand the implications of informational gaps and asymmetries in market markets which are which are ubiquitous you know what we're discovering um is that with digital technology and 20 years of evolution and learning that data is starting to close those gaps um now, you know, so for example, uh, in China, there's an entity called MyBank, 30% owned by Ant Financial, that lends to small businesses with employees of five or fewer kind of, you know, itty bitty enterprises. These are enterprises that have no collateral. Uh, they have virtually no track record in the non-digital world that they can rely on to establish their, you know, trustworthiness or creditworthiness. They're basically, you know, out on their own. Uh, they have kind of local networks like family and friends that help them get started. But, but w w when you take a big elaborate e-commerce and mobile payments and fintech system and the data it generates and then, and then use that in benign ways, you can actually dramatically, inclusively expand the accessibility of markets, of services, of a whole lot of things. And there's a growing batch of studies of this. And when you stand back from it, you realize it's not just the economy. Uh, you can do the same thing in education, and there are more than one unicorn 
there's more than one unicorn in the world that's doing exactly that in a variety of places, including India. It's also true of healthcare. Um, you know, I mean, there's lots of things in the world that we used to live in where remoteness is really costly. Like you're not near doctors, your primary care options are limited. Those gaps um, are being closed. And so I think it's the, the upside of this is really exciting. Um, mm -hmm. Having said that, there's one serious issue underneath that really has to be dealt with. All of these applications require that data that used to be essentially not data, but information scattered around and inaccessible, um, has to be in the digital world, you, centralized, made accessible, and, uh, and used. And because that's how these things work. That's how the platforms work. That's how fintech works. That's how, uh, you know, uh, big data DNA sequencing to discover, you know, vulnerabilities and new therapeutics and so on works. I mean, it's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. And so we need to address the question of what is the responsible use of data and, 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 and addressing it by saying, there's an important privacy issue is only part of the problem, right? We, we have to address the benefits and the costs and figure out regimes that people are comfortable with. So, I mean, that's the path we're on. Yeah. The pandemic has made this clear because there's digital tools uh, that you can use if you trust the, the, uh, the people who have access to the data that materially affect the speed with which you can deal with the pandemic by and large in the West, we haven't used them because we they, we either are so worried about the privacy issues or we don't trust the government or the entities that that might help us use those tools to to track infections and and uh, and so on. Yeah, and we also see, particularly as the pandemic exacerbated the inequality in the advanced countries. Right. That the tensions that lead to that inequality, and in America, we're dealing with concerns about the prison industrial system, law enforcement modes of behavior. But one of them that I've been working with a group of people on recently is the payday loan kind of predator, where sure. financial services for the underserved are negligible. And I think right. something like 86% of the people who do not have bank accounts in America are people of color. And the prospect of FinTech, and I'm not talking about some science fiction vision, I'm talking about things that have already been implemented in much of the developing world. Yeah. Being adapted for these purposes here might give these people more access to credit and credit at a fair price and alleviate some of the inequality that by, by making the world better. I, I agree with that, Rob. You know, it's, it, it always stuns me. I mean, I do believe the Chinese, the Chinese in this dimension, in this dimension, have made major progress that, you know, needs to be um, studied and learned about, adapted and used for the benefit of underserved populations everywhere. Uh, but there's just a huge bias, uh, you know, an obvious huge bias, you know, against that. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a little pessimistic about the speed of technology transfer. Having said that, you know, there are serious entities in the United States that are using platforms to do mortgages. They're trying to get rid of the biases that are mm -hmm. built into the, you know, the old systems where humans look at somebody and say, well, that, you know, that's a crappy zip code and I don't, you know, and you're the wrong color. So, uh, we're not going to do that. So you know, it's not as if there aren't a lot of good people trying, but I'll, t I'll tell you one thing. It, it, it helps it, it, if you have trusted entities, you know, with the right motivation, it helps enormously, you know, if there are big piles of data to rely on. I mean, you know, China isn't dominated by a monopoly in the payment system or even e-commerce, but, but, <laughs> but, but almost everybody you know, has 
uh, mobile payment system, right? right? And not just on uh, not just on the platforms. I mean, for the whole consumer side of the economy, mm-hmm. and that means that somewhere there's a record of people's behavior vir- on, on, on virtually everything they do and buy and sell. So, so I think we'll get there, but you know, it's sometimes it's painful to watch the speed of dis- diffusion. Yeah, though I think you mentioned earlier dissemination of education to the underserved. Well, that will yeah. collect data and so forth. Uh, everybody in the world can get an Ivy League education now electronically as, as long as they've got a cell phone and a mobile system. So I was all yeah. I'm saying, Mike, is your fan base is going to go up tenfold. But... Uh, <laughs> But well, you know, in addition, Rob, you can use, there are, again, companies, very innovative ones, using artificial intelligence to fine-tune the education process, mm-hmm. um, you know, so that you kind of pick off, you know, in a very intelligent way what the problems are for, for individual students. And then, and then, then in real time, um, uh, you know, adjust the curriculum so that they don't get yeah. kind of left behind. Yeah, this is a work in progress. They're going to get better and better at it, but it's really promising. And I think also in this in the skills translation area, it's mm-hmm. it's it's a potentially powerful tool as well. Yeah, I'm working on one right now where a course which shows the genius of John Coltrane is being used to create respect Fantastic. among wealthy Caucasian children for their peers of color, because you can't listen to John Coltrane and not put him in the neighborhood with Mozart, Bach, Beethoven, or Paul McCartney. And so it's, it's right. an authentic diffusion into the heart of right. respect for people of color. It's, it's a wonderful teaching device by a woman named Christine Pastorella, who calls it Kids for Coltrane. But uh, so fantastic. There, there's some exciting possibilities on the horizon and maybe now as we band together in the aftermath of the pandemic or it's not an aftermath yet but but the impetus to work together to heal our society may be stronger than it was before we face this challenge let me turn to the question that when i run a podcast people are most haunted by will the exhaustion of the pandemic impede or accelerate the way society addresses climate change. Some say we've used our fiscal capacity. Some say nobody wants to change jobs again after all of this. But on the other side, they say, well, we've unmasked that there are a lot of collective challenges that we have to embrace together. And particularly as you and I are working with our, along with Joe Stiglitz, as you and he are the co-chairs of the Commission on Global Economic Transformation, with the demographic bulge on the horizon in Africa, being an equatorial region, how subsistence farming is affected by global warming and all of the social design and social policies that result. These are fantastically important challenges and climate is the disruptor that sits at the core. How do you see climate in, in light of what we've experienced? Well, I'm, I'm kind of consciously optimistic for the following reasons. One, um, hats off to Europe, all right? Europe's come together around two things. One, uh, you know, this emergency fund, which means we've stopped pretending that we're not in it together. And I think that's a hugely important development. Second, I, I would say Europe is clearly now in the lead, uh, or certainly way up, uh, you know, high on the list in leading on on com- serious commitment to and investment in uh, greening technology and addressing the climate change challenge. So I mean, I, so so that's just good news. You can say similar things, but they're not as powerful about state and municipal level activities in the United States that we all know the federal government dropped out. And we probably the majority of people on this call hope that that uh, trajectory gets reversed sometime in the next month or two. Uh, But we'll see. That's not a done deal. 
But in Africa, uh, you've got two huge challenges, uh, you know, in a country that has, in, in a continent that has enormous potential. One, one, and you and I have talked about them both. And, so, well, there are three. One, the pandemic is going to hit hard um, in the way we described before. So they've been knocked back and they don't have <clears throat> the fiscal resources. We'll probably have debt restructuring, you know, that needs to be done, you know, or defaults or some version of that. They don't have the medical capacity. So the, the health side of it, um, even if it may not, not be a disaster economically, is going to be some kind of disaster in humanitarian terms. So you got the pandemic, then you've got um, then you've got uh, this demographic bulge of you know the fertility rates um, in, in in many parts of Africa are just way higher than anywhere else, and and so even without you know additional challenges, inventing a growth model that uh, that creates enough jobs to employ the bulge of young people that come when the fertility rate is five or six or seven is a real challenge, you know, and there mm -hmm. may not be such a thing. I mean, you and I have talked to people who have said the only way to address this is to empower women and get the, the fertility rates down. But as you told me just a few minutes ago, you know, we've already got the bulge coming. I mean, it, you know, it's and the next 40 years. Past 20. It's yeah, in the next there. 40 years. Yeah. And third, you know, climate change looks, and that I'm not an expert on this, I'm just repeating what the experts say, looks like it, the, the southern hemisphere and particularly parts of Africa are going to be hit the hardest by climate change. And so I, I would say in, in kind of human terms, you'd, you'd probably have to put this up near I mean, it's easy to get engaged in all these tensions and this, that, and the other thing. But, but I think <clears throat> coming together internationally um, around climate change, support for African countries, support for really effective young leaders there to help them get the job they want to do done is, uh, is to me, top of the priority list. And as you mentioned earlier in this conversation, the role of technology and market development and integration, yep. provided we can put the public goods of infrastructure on that continent and in other yep. parts of the global south. And secondly, yep. the dissemination of education to the underserved. If we're gonna be moving to a knowledge intensive economy straight away, not through manufacturing and infant industry protection, which we call the East Asian model, training young people in Africa India and other places can be helped by technology yeah. in that yeah. in that diffusion of the yeah. various skills and which am I call awareness of governance and what a good hearted society should look like. All of these things can be debated and reach every corner of the planet. Yeah, I think I think that's right, Robin. I think we're aim we're trying to get go in that direction. There's a high level UN panel. Uh, co-chaired by Melinda Gates and Jack Ma, that, you know, mm -hmm. is highlighting this issue. You know, you have fiber running around in the ocean, right? you know, around big, big pipes running around most of Africa now. Uh, there's serious work, you know, being done to build the infrastructure. You don't have to build expensive landline systems. You know, 5G is revolutionary with respect to high-speed access pretty much everywhere. It, it, you still need infrastructure, but you don't need, it's not as daunting as it looked like it was 25 years ago when the discussion was, you know, an unbridgeable digital divide. Um, and then you've got lots of entrepreneurs uh, and lots of people trying to help them too. Stanford has programs, you know, Sam Palmazano's uh, center has programs, you know, specifically, to help you know these really talented young entrepreneurs get a little bit of to get exactly the kind of support that they get from the ecosystems that we're used to in Europe and America, if, yeah. say in Silicon Valley. Yeah. I mean, so so I I think you know I think there's a good chance that this transition, uh, you know, 
it, it won't be perfect and it'll 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 be a struggle but i i think there's a real chance it'll go okay i just had a nice conversation with a gentleman i met a little over a year ago who's in the hotel and restaurant business in africa and he was very optimistic because he said in years past you had to take young people to Europe or Canada or the United States to train and then bring yeah. them back. Whereas now with remote education, it might be possible to keep the workforce nearby and get them high quality training in what it means to be a gifted and, and earnest service employee. So uh, yeah. why don't we turn now I, back I to- I would say not, not, just train, not just training, Rob, but into networks. You know, no, into support right. networks. That's I think, right. I think we, we have the ability to do that now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, that's a good point. Let's uh, go back to Tito's network and cultivate some learning for you and me through the questions that he brings to bear. Good. Perfect. Vi avevo preannunciato che. Well, uh, I had announced that we uh, were having a very thrilling discussion. And indeed, uh, we really received uh, a, a very good uh, view. Uh, there are major issues at stake, but time uh, was limited. Uh, we now have an idea uh, how the uh, geography, the economic geography is changing. We heard about the new challenges to multilateralism and uh, uh, the new challenges adding up to all challenges. We heard about uh, the trends uh, going on uh, on a global scale. We heard about what is changing uh, in terms of information gap. Mike Spence, as I said at the beginning, uh, received the uh, Nobel Prize for uh, his uh, work on uh, information asymmetries. He is working with Habke, uh, you know, and the availability of data is such that uh, we have uh, filled many of the information gaps of the past. Unfortunately, uh, having uh, a lot of information uh, is not necessarily better than having scanty information because we need to be able to process and analyze the information we have and not all have the necessary tools to do that. We heard about the inequalities within uh, individual countries, problems of cash flow and credits uh, that many companies have and how uh, we can work on that. I'm sure there will be I mean, questions on the role that governments have in facing these new uh, inequalities and the problems that uh, the different industries might have in the future. They also talked about climate change. Uh, it has been clearly stated that there are global uh, changes and very diversified uh, effects. And the southern hemisphere is the one uh, which uh, will suffer most from climate change. So we have to uh, pay attention to that part of the world. There are many topics at stake. I'm sure that will receive the questions. They have not yet arrived. But I take the opportunity while we are waiting for the questions to ask a question to our uh, distinguished speakers. Tomorrow, we will uh, meet virtually uh, the Prime Minister of Italy, Mr. Giuseppe Conte. Uh, the Italian government is doing a major effort to fully use the great opportunity, uh, as uh, uh, Michael said, uh, uh, from the uh, next uh, EU generation fund. If you were to give a piece of advice 
So far, the Italian government just uh, uh, asked the different ministries and departments in Italy to uh, formulate some projects to use uh, this uh, huge amount of money, some of that is in the form of grants, which Italy will receive in the next five years. So uh, the different uh, administrations were asked uh, to offer different projects, and many were received. And the Italian government is finding it difficult to define the priorities. Uh, what is the direction to follow? Where are investments to be made? If you were to give a piece of advice to our prime minister, uh, who will visit us tomorrow virtually, and how uh, to use this huge amount of money, what would you say? Yes. So uh, let me just, I mean, and I don't mean to be rude about this, but the context is we, we are in a country, and he is the prime minister of a country that has struggled with growth for at least two decades. Uh, prior to that, there were episodes of pretty good growth. So, you know, rather than directly answer the question, I think, I think what the prime minister needs to do um, is not just collect a bunch of opinions, but is, but see if he can, by consulting broadly um, with business people, with academics, and so on, reach some kind of consensus on what the factors are that are constraining growth. Um, and and if that can be done, I mean, we all have opinions about that, but I, I mean, I don't think individual opinions are what's needed. A cacophony of individual opinions. I think somebody's got to try to pull it together and see if there's some at least core agreement on that. Uh, and and then I would, you know, I would take uh, the funds that are um, available from the from the European Union, financed, by the way, with your European Union debt, which is, a, is another innovation, um, and focus them on investments that are designed to generate growth, and particularly growth that benefits the young people who have been, we didn't talk about it, but um, there's considerable concern, you know, and people talk about it all the time. Mario Draghi talks about it. Uh, the President of the Republic talks about it. I mean, there's there's serious concern, you know, that people who are getting their educations loosed up and the job market's not very good, um, they don't have any seniority, are gonna get hit pretty hard from this. And I think the answer is, is not just sort of social safety nets, um, but it's real growth. Uh, now, what those investments are, I mean, you know, I think we're under investing in, you know, the t science and technology base of the economy and the human capital that goes with it, in part. Um, so that would be part of my answer. But, you know, I, I don't I, I don't think uh, I'd rather be part of a group that comes up with a consensus on that. Rob, what do you think? My uh, suggestion to any prime minister, I'm not living in Italy, so uh, I think it would uh, apply to all of them, is that what is in huge deficit around the world today is something called trust. Trust in governance, trust that we're all working together to make things better. And so I would pick out some sectors or some elements related to younger people to enhance the lives of the phrase I use of the underserved as a demonstration that we're not just willy nilly, what you might call victims of market, but we use markets as a tool to facilitate progress and healing because we are at a fork in the road right now. A guy named Robert Johnson, a bull blues singer, talks about the crossroads. And so I'll, I'll invoke that, given my given name. At the crossroads, we can resort to despondency, submission to authoritarian rule out of despair, or we can go to the path of healing and reinvigoration of trust but we've got to demonstrate something different 
I think in the United States, it might be that change of course in climate that you talked about. But I think for most places, it's how we shepherd the young people. Young people with fresh eyes just saw the huge fault lines and failings of our system. And as older generations, as custodians for their future, we got to reinvest in things that inspire them to believe that we're back on track. Thank you. Thank you, uh, both of you, for the very useful uh, suggestion that uh, we will convey che sicuramente questi suggerimenti anche di metodo. Che... So certainly uh, tomorrow we will convey your thoughts and suggestions uh, to the Italian Prime Minister. And I apologize because I was constantly looking at the iPad and my mobile, I, not because I was not paying attention, but because that is the way by which people send their questions to, to me. And there are two questions, actually, that were asked. One is about a topic which uh, you did not dwell upon, but you touched it, and it is the topic of uh, the... Um, borders, so to say, of the activity of a state. During the pandemic, the state uh, has extended its scope of action. It has intervened in sectors where it did not intervene in the past, um, so much so that uh, a number of uh, personal uh, rights and freedoms were touched. Uh, and this went beyond uh, what is normally done by states, going beyond the fiscal capacity of states. So what do you think about this phenomenon? Do you think that in the next years um, the state will have uh, to have uh, a low profile, to keep a low profile, so to say, after having done so much? And then there is a second question about uh, closing information gaps uh, that Michael uh, mentioned extensively. So do you believe that the closing of uh, the information gaps uh, will be accompanied by a better capability of using uh, the vastness of information that are by now accessible um, on the web and uh, through big data. So do you think actually that there is the capability of using information well or is it too much information that we have and that is worse than no information at all? So these are the two questions. I don't know who wishes to answer. The first question was about the scope of activity of the state, the size of the state, and the second question, uh, information gaps. Uh, so are we closing the information gaps? Will they be closed? Bob, is a question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, on the question of the size of the state, I actually, despite the rise of nationalism, feel that we are in a dilemma. There's a dilemma between the sensitivity of local governments, but they don't have control of all the influences that affect the people that have elected them. At the global level, everything's under the roof, but you're too far away to simply, to sensitively detect what some of the challenges are. If we devolve into this kind of hostile, despairing nationalism, we won't solve some of the problems we have to solve together. Mike, you talk about health systems in India. Well, India's got to pour its fiscal capacity into its health system, and planet Earth needs to transform India's energy system away from carbon. So we're going to need us in the advanced countries to get a lot more involved in global collaboration to address the climate change issue effectively at the same time as people in our countries are yearning for that local attention and sensitivity to their problems. So I think the, I think the challenge of governance is enormously difficult, given all of the scar tissue that resonates 
based on the failings of recent years. And I know you and Joe and Danny Roderick and others are working on our global commission on the question of what kind of globalization coheres and, and brings back what I referred to in the last question, trust and faith that we're so that, that humanity could thrive. Yeah, it's really one of the most difficult questions. Like, um, and but Danny, Joe, and many people are are trying to think it through. I mean, there was a one one of the years that the Festival of Economics was focused on this question, the tension between sovereignty on the one hand, and you know, and governance structures and and kind of global influences and, and so on. We, we haven't solved that problem. On, on the informational thing, I, I, I think I can be fairly clear and fairly brief. It's possible to have too much information if you don't have any way to process it. Um, so if you go back, I mean, the, the first ver real version of artificial intelligence application was actually search, right? So if you go back, and if you, for those of you who can remember this far back, when you did searches in the late 90s, when, when we got access to the World Wide Web, which was invented, by the way, in 1989, um, this astonishingly fast kind of explosion of access and, and impact, um, you got literally rubbish, right? And, you know, and that's kind of the most basic tool. So all the information is out there or a growing body of it. Almost everything's digitized now. It wasn't then. But there was a lot of it, and we didn't know how to kind of get the stuff we wanted. And now, over time, because of a lot of innovation, and it really it is the core of what, what is now turned into image recognition and sensible recommendations to people on, on platforms and so on, we're learning how to process that information in ways that are beneficial to the players in the game. Um, you know, consumers on one side, people who are searching for information on one side, um, and so on. And so I actually think, you know, that's kind of the path, the innovation path we're on. Now, in the, in the, in the area of markets and commerce, you know, the model everybody started out with was eBay, right? And they, they, this, the secret sauce in eBay was it was a highly fragmented market for people who traded collectibles. I mean, I don't know if I mean, many people don't remember this far back. And that, that was fragmented because you couldn't find, the sellers and buyers couldn't find each other except through a few little fairs that occurred. And so it was all the physical world. And so a couple of entrepreneurs at Stanford decided that, you know, well, you could do this online and all of a sudden the cost of finding each other, which is the most basic, the most basic element in forming a market, you know, could be solved at negligible marginal cost on the web. Once they got going on that, then, then, then that created, you know, potentially created, you know, literally millions and millions of new markets. Um, and so, so then the question, and a lot of people thought, well, that solved the problem, but that's not the only informational problem. So the second problem that showed up once, you know, we had sort of people moving into that territory, virtually every e-commerce platform was modeled on that in one form or another. Alibaba, you know, was modeled on, on eBay. Mercado Libre in Latin America was modeled on eBay, and eBay was a major participant in the start. And what they discovered is there was another informational problem, which is the buyers didn't trust the sellers to deliver the product, and the sellers didn't trust the buyers to pay for it. And that had a, that's, an, <laughs> that's a significant kind of problem. Uh, and, and that problem exists even if both the buyers and sellers are, are, are you know, trustworthy because there's no way to know it, right? The question is, is there, is there a way to close that gap? is to screen or signal uh, so that the gap gets closed. And so what, what these people did is, all of them, is they created uh, what we now call payment systems that were complements to the e-commerce platforms. But the payment, if you look carefully, so we got PayPal and Alipay and Mercado Pago. And if you look carefully at what they did at the start, they, they weren't high-tech marbles. They, they were just an escrow operation that you're familiar with from real estate. 
right? They collected the money and the product and then and tried to convince people that they were trustworthy and they succeeded in that. And then they crossed the transaction over and the, and the transaction started to grow. If you look at other e-commerce platforms, you know, then, then the informational complexity and density started to increase. So the Airbnb uh, grew very rapidly in part because people of the original insight, people, buyers and sellers of rental properties could find each other, but it also had a two-way evaluation system, right? Which changes two things. One, it changes the informational structure, right? Because you, you get, you, over time, you start to get a feel for who you're dealing with, but it changes the incentives as well. Why? Because if I trash an apartment that I rent, then I'm not going to have access to that marketplace in the future. And ditto, if I'm a seller of a, of a rental property, selling the, you know, the thing for a week, and I mislead you on that, I'll get a terrible rating. And that, again, the informational structure of the markets is closed. And now what we're seeing is that with the accumulation of data, massive amounts of data around the e-commerce and fintech platforms, especially the mobile payments platforms, that you're able to essentially take pe people and entities that are completely unknown quantities in the non-digital world and give them an identity and a track record so that you can do business with them. Hmm. And that's what I mean by closing the informational gaps. It's revolutionary. And, and it's revolutionary mainly in the inclusiveness dimension. You know, a gigantic corporation is not going to have any trouble doing business with J.P. Morgan, right? But a little tiny enterprise somewhere far out in the west part of China uh, is going to have trouble getting financing to build their little business. And so that, that's where I think we're going. And, that, and that's where I think the lessons are. Uh, that are being developed in a lot of the different parts of the world that need to be shared so that we move down that path as fast as we can. Sorry well, to be long-winded. No, Mike, no, let no, me, no, I just want to add quickly important. to what you say. There's a film that's just come out in the United States that's causing quite a stir called The Social mm -hmm. Dilemma. And the statement at the outset of the film, the epigraph, is nothing vast encounters the life of mortals without a curse. That's by Sophocles. <laughs> And so That's what fair. I see as you're talking, and I'm, I'm feeling this, all of these potentials are there, but the scale that humanity is touched by this technology produces in me my recommendation to the Italian prime minister. Study how the psychological effects of online affect the minds and development of children because that's really preparing us to meet the challenge of a healthy society in the future. And I think there are potential curses and tremendous potential possibilities standing side by side with regard to the continued expansion of, of digital commerce and learning and what have you. Grazie per queste vostre... I'm sorry, go ahead, Tito. I was just going to say, there's lots of downsides. If we mismanage the data, we'll never get there. You know, if we screw up, you know, people's minds, the young people's minds, we'll never get there. If we don't regulate it properly, we'll get this P2P lending fiasco that we saw in, in China, where they basically had to shut the whole sector down. So there's going to be lots of experiments and mistakes as we go through this. This isn't an exercise in perfection at all. Go ahead, grazie, grazie, grazie. But it's got to be laced with ethics. It's got to be underpinned by a sense of ethics. Well, I'm sorry, time is nearly over. Thank you very much for uh, the complete answers. And uh, there are uh, two important questions. Um, please be uh, brief. I know uh, that uh, this is very difficult, uh, but uh, my first uh, question concerns the fact that uh, uh, distance learning is 
feasible. Uh, Ivy League is, uh, uh, you know, available all over the world. Do you think that distance learning is really possible? A second question is labor organization. Do you think that in the future we will uh, all work remotely? And cities will no longer be important. Uh, they are very difficult, I know. Maybe a short answer would be interesting. I'll make a, I'll make a, a quick run at the first part of this. Distance learning based on study groups I've been involved in at the World Economic, World Economic Forum and other places is possible but it needs to be augmented by personal contact. Tutors, mentors, study groups, TAs. If you just sit down with 24-hour lectures, very few people make their way all the way through. So human connection that augments the underlying curriculum is necessary to give guidance, give support, and give inspiration so that remote learning can reach its potential. Yeah, I agree with that, Tito. I mean, I, I, it, it seems to me the pandemic economy forced us to, into using digital technology as a substitute for sort of in-person learning, but its natural role is as a complement. That is, it augments rather than... Uh, than, than replaces, uh, and I think that's true at all levels. I mean, I, I haven't heard anybody say that, you know, kids who are 12 and 13 years old are going to do fine in online education. You know, maybe it's different with a different level if we had more time. Uh, uh, I, I, I think in, in a higher education, there's at least in America, there's going to be an enormous shake of... Uh, and a whole bunch of entities are going to fail. And maybe they should, you know, on value of added relation to cost. They were, they were being propped up by massive amounts of student debt being there. And they're, they're really in big trouble financially. So, so maybe they won't make it. And, and you know, in, the, in that sense, I think uh, the pandemic is going to have a kind of lasting structural effect. And labor? Uh, what was the question on labor? It was simply uh, we gonna... whether there will be a reduction in agglomeration economies and uh, uh, we are going to see uh, people working from home and remote working will reduce agglomeration economies. Ho ripetuto la domanda che ho fatto prima in italiano. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> that's a huge question. So you and I ought to get together and spend three hours talking about yeah. it. But, um, so right now, the estimate that I got, got from guys at the University of Chicago is a third of the jobs in America are doable from home, you know, so the other two thirds aren't. And I don't think, you know, overnight that situation is going to change. Um, so the bottom line is, and, and, and then there's a question, you know, are we going to sort of hollow out cities like New York? because we're going to have larger fractions of people working at home and all that stuff. And with the answer to that is maybe, but we don't know. Uh, and, but, but, uh, but uh, on balance, I, I think the, the way, at least the way I think about it is, is simply there, there is a mega trend, which is the building of the economy on a digital foundation. And that is going to affect almost everybody in terms of what jobs they have, if you listen to James Manika and the other people who've st studied this, you know, the way they do it is they sort of ask, well, which jobs have large amounts of activities that are automatable and, and so on. So, I mean, I think the, the world of work is going to be um, uh, kind of on an evolutionary ba ba basis, you know, changed in a major way. Grazie mille. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, answering all these questions. Uh, uh, we would love to stay here uh, for hours. Um, and I'm sure that uh, you uh, would like to stay for hours. 
I see that from your uh, passion. Unfortunately, uh, time is uh, over already, uh, 10 minutes. Uh, so thank you very much again for being with us. And I hope that we really could meet uh, next year here in prisons physically, because this is the beauty of the Festival of Trento, I, uh, being able to talk directly. Uh, indeed, uh, we like uh, to be in the same place to share the experiences. Thank you very much and hope we could meet next year here in Trento. Good night. Thanks, Tito. It's great to see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, guys.